thank you so much for joining us for this first installment of Ethics for UBC, where we'll be focusing on the arts today. I'm Louise Harding and I'll be the facilitator for today. I'm a Master of Science student in Population and Public Health here at UBC on the Vancouver campus, and I'm a student in Neuroethics Canada. And before we start, I want to thank the President's Office for supporting this important initiative and let you know that this session is being recorded. So I'm going to hand the mic to Dr. Judith Hall to introduce the session. Dr. Hall is a clinical geneticist and pediatrician who is presently a professor emerita of pediatrics and medical genetics based at Children's and Women's Health Center. Over to you, Dr. Hall. Thank you and welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us for this panel discussion on ethics in the arts. Um, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver campus um, is situated on the traditional unceded and ancestral ter territories of the Musqueam people. And the UBC Okanagan campus is situated on the territory of the Salish Okanagan nation and their people. And as our audience probably comes from many different areas, uh, near and far, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of their land as well. Ethics in the Arts is the first installation of Ethics for UBC, a five-part series of panel discussions organized by Dr. Judy Illis and Dr. Paul Van Darkenkler and the graduate student Louise Harding, who will actually be moderating the session. There are ethical issues in every discipline. And in a very troubled time like today, they deserve to be discussed and understood. So this series, it aims at exploring and strengthening ethics scholarship and education across the Vancouver and Okanagan campuses and to advance UBC as a leader among Canadian universities in ethics scholarship and education. These discussions are for you, our audience, students, faculty, research, alumni, to learn about the current landscape of ethics at our university and the opportunities to become involved. I'm a clinical medical geneticist, long retired, but I can tell you that every single family I saw raised important ethical questions and these need to be discussed. So today our exceptional panelists will share their insights and experience with ethics across a variety of disciplines from music and fine arts to communication and culture. I shall now turn it over to our moderator, Ms. Louise Harding. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. So the structure for the session today is that we're going to start with a half hour of roundtable discussion amongst the panelists, and then we will separate into breakout rooms for 20 minutes where you get to ask panelists of your choice questions and have one-on-one -on -one discussions. So I'm going to ask that the audience members try to hold the majority of their questions until that time when you can speak directly to the panelists. And then we will all come back to the main room for a final wrap up by 5.15 p.m. Or to close the event at 5.15. So I'm going to start by introducing our panelists and then introduce the first question. So Dr. Allison Conway is a professor of English and Gender and Women's Studies at UBC Okanagan. She's Associate Dean of Research, Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And her forthcoming book examines the 18th century novel's account of interfaith marriage and its relation to debates about religious toleration. Dr. Susan Cox is a professor in the W. Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics and in the School of Population and Public Health, where she also directs the PhD MSc program. She has exper expertise in medical sociology, qualitative methodology and ethics, and has used arts-based inquiry in a number of different ways in her research. Dr. Gage Averill serves as the Dean of Arts at UBC. 
He has served as the president of the Society for Ethnomusicology in the past from 2009 to 2011. And his books on Haitian popular music and barbershop harmony have won numerous best book prizes and his box CD set, Alan Lomax and Haiti 1936 to 37 earned two Grammy nominations. And finally, Dr. Link Kessler is an associate professor in the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies and English. He was the inaugural director of the First Nation Studies Program, and from 2009 to 2018 was the director of the First Nations House of Learning and senior advisor to the president on Aboriginal affairs, coordinating the 2009 Aboriginal Strategic Plan. His Indigenous ancestry is Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. So thank you uh, to all of the panelists for coming today. I'm really looking forward to learning from you. And I'm sure all of the participants are really excited to have such a multidisciplinary group. So we have four guiding questions for today. And I'm going to ask you to speak for about a minute or 90 seconds on each one. So our first question is uh, to start by asking you to each tell us about your area of interest and about others who share it at UBC Vancouver and UBC Okanagan. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Conway for this one. Hi, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Salix people in the Okanagan Valley. Um, so my research interest encompasses feminist theory and the cultural history of 18th century Britain, in particular, the development of the modern novel and interests that are shared by a number of faculty in humanities programs on the UBC, uh, both Vancouver and Okanagan campuses, the departments of modern languages and history, histories of art, gender and women's studies. And scholars who are interested in this cultural history are particularly um, interested in the ethical questions particular to modern culture. So about the rise of capitalism, individualism, the expansion of the British Empire and Europe, and the settling of indigenous lands by Anglo-European in, um, colonialists. And novels, my claim is that uh, novels are particularly well suited to ask ethical questions because they represent uh, a variety of perspectives. And realist fiction, which was developed in this period, is particularly significant insofar as it tries to recreate the world as we know it. And its proximity to the everyday renders it uh, ethical challenges familiar to its readers. And feminist and post-colonial critics are particularly interested to trace the voices of marginalized figures that appear in novels like Robinson Crusoe, as well as to recover uh, less well-known works um, often by women or members of the of colonial um, uh, or indigenous communities in order to provide an alternative story to the one told by mainstream history. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Conway. Dr. Cox, uh, you're up next. Thank you. So I'm uh, an interdisciplinary qualitative health researcher, and my main field of work at the moment is in population and public health, but I'm also part of the Center for Applied Ethics. And one of my main areas of interest is in the arts and health. And I'm interested in this in a couple of ways. Um, the first being in how the arts and creative expression, you know, be it through poetry or or painting or playing the piano, uh, all support well being and healthy aging and contribute to healing when we're unwell. I'm equally interested in arts based methods of doing research, and that's uh, using the arts as a form of inquiry in research and as a means of uh, translating research into a form that can have a big impact for audiences beyond the academic world. And prior to COVID, there were quite a group of us at UBC, both faculty and graduate students who had a mutual interest in these topics around arts and health. And we came together to form a community of practice with the intention of uh, bringing researchers and artists together to collaborate in working with all types of literary, visual and performative arts. Uh, so that we could share ideas and network and provide support to one another in this new area of inquiry. 
And there are also a number of other significant initiatives uh, in arts-based methods at UBC. And one that I'm active with is the research-based theater collaborative that is led by my colleague, George Bellavo, and funded through the VPRI cluster grants program. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. Uh, Dr. Averill. Great. Uh, th yeah, thank you so much. And the um, it's a real honor to be here today. I uh, really excited about being with this uh, this group of panelists. I'm, I'm by training an ethnomusicologist, uh, which is a mouthful, and it's it's a disciplinary identity that I share with uh, really only three other professors at UBC, but more than a handful of graduate students here. I was primarily trained as an anthropologist of music. Um, and my, the methods I, I utilize really combine historical study, ethnography, uh, close-up living, um, studied natural um, music systems, the production and the consumption of music. So you could, uh, although it's a small group of ethnomusicologists, I also share some, some of the questions we'll be looking at today, these sort of ethical challenges more broadly with sociocultural anthropologists as a whole, um, especially around the ethical challenges of ethnography and fieldwork. So I work primarily in, uh, on popular music and the ways in which it intersects and, and interacts with power relations uh, in Haiti, although I've done other kinds of work. But I'm gonna be talking about Haiti today, in particular because of those, those special ethical issues that are, emerge uh, from um, what you know some decades ago were called first world and third world issues or, or global north and global south issues. Um, and especially those around, um, around reciprocity. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Kessler, we'll wrap up with you on this question. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have a couple of different sides to my work. Currently, I'm actually working on a book in early modern studies. Uh, so that's a return to an area that I was away from for more than 20 years uh, actively. But since I've been at UBC, um, I've been working primarily in Indigenous studies and in setting up curriculum for uh, initially for the First Nations, what was then the First Nations Studies Program, which focused a lot on community-based research uh, and on the ethics of working with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities. So that's an area of real concern to me and my colleagues in that program and then uh, colleagues in the Okanagan and then, of course, colleagues across other departments throughout the university. Um, in uh, much of my time at UBC, I was involved in uh, administrative positions and working really across faculties in the development of programs that addressed Indigenous concerns and uh, the many ways in which uh, those same kind of uh, ethical questions regarding research and curriculum development uh, play out in, uh, in those areas as well. Finally, I would say that I spent a lot of time at UBC thinking about uh, institutional uh, design and the development of programs and the ways that they can be made um, uh, serve better the development of indigenous curriculum and engagement. And I would say the ethical issues internally to the university are no less challenging than the research issues with communities, uh, and they are a, an area in their own. Uh, and, and uh, at times an incredibly difficult one. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another area which has been quite actively involved. Thank you. So the second question is about um, cutting edge ethical issues in your area of interest. So the we've split the question into sort of two options. So either uh, let us know about uh, some cutting edge ethical issues in your area of interest, or give us an example of a specific ethical dilemma you've encountered and how you addressed it. So you can keep it either more general or give us a specific example. And I'll start with Dr. Cox on this question. Thanks, Louise. So there's a lot of challenging ethical issues that arise when we use arts-based uh, methods as a form of inquiry. And in one of the projects I've been working with recently, we've been using the arts to explore and document what it means to live well with dementia to the end of life. And working collaboratively with people with dementia and their care partners, we held a whole series of art-making workshops that provided participants 
with the opportunity to draw or paint or sculpt or create photos or collage or poetry, all as a means of expressing what they wanted others to know about living well with dementia. And this was a very powerful experience for everyone, but particularly for those who struggle to express themselves in words. And within the pandemic, of course, like many researchers, we had to move online to complete this project. And that posed a lot of challenges in terms of how we could create and share art online together. But one blessing in disguise was that it forced us to shift from having our planned art exhibition in a gallery to creating an online art exhibition that features over 60 artworks and a short documentary about the project. And we launched that just over a year ago. And to date, it's had over 2,800 visitors from 38 countries. So we were very excited about the reach of this approach. But as you might imagine, it was essential that participants consent to each piece of artwork being shared in this way. And given our commitments to working collaboratively to try and amplify the voices of people with dementia, each participant also needed to have a role in collectively determining how the exhibition would look and feel. And so one dilemma that arose in this context had to do with how we identified each of the artists. Uh, because we were sharing original artworks, it was natural for many of the people to want to have their names acknowledged alongside their work. But of course, this runs counter to the guiding principles of institutional research ethics, which require that researchers give priority to maintaining the anonymity of participants, especially since the diagnosis of dementia still carries a very heavy social stigma. This was a heavy question. And on top of this, we also had to make a decision about whether or not to identify each artist's work according to whether it was done by someone with dementia, a care partner, or a member of the research team. So on the one hand, it was important to uphold participant autonomy and decision making, and on the other, we had responsibilities to avoid causing harm. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks for that detailed answer, Dr. Cox. Uh, Dr. Averill. Uh, you know, I loved, by the way, uh, Susan, I loved your, your comment about um, uh, institutional re research ethics, because in, in my field where we were originally trained to preserve recordings forever, to do work in real sites where people make music, essentially bars and clubs, things like that, um, and, to, and to promote the artists with whom we worked the injunctions in research ethics to destroy recordings after six months after, after publication, never, uh, never do research where people are drinking and, uh, and can't give informed consent. And then uh, uh, to, um, um, what was the other question? The, uh, uh, to promote the, the names of the artists when we we're uh, told to an uh, anonymize the details were, were uh, it was almost as if they were trying to outlaw my discipline. Um, but let me just talk, I mentioned I'd talk a little bit about um, uh, reciprocity, which is, a, which is a very broad topic in, in ethics. You know, so, many, so many world religions have a kind of reciprocity uh, in the heart of the tenets of the religion. You know, we do unto others as we'd like to be treated uh, as done unto us. Um, and in particular, an anthropologist had this special interest in how th something like gift exchanges sustain cultures and, and stabilize them. So anthropologists are particularly sensitive to the question of unequal exchange. And coming from a, you know, a wealthy uh, nation, working as a young, at that time, uh, when I started a young scholar um, in, a, in a destitute and um, marginalized country, this, I think I was obsessed with this notion of what it was I could, I could contribute. And I wasn't working in a small community um, where you can find a role for yourself as an ethnographer and find a way of, of trade. I was working with hundreds of musicians and, and, um, uh, and bands who were, you know, many of them middle class, some the ranged classes in Haiti, but uh, most of whom would have, would have been um, insulted by the question of exchanging money uh, to do what I was doing. And um, what they really wanted me to do, as it turned out, was do something they thought I could I could contribute, which was uh, to um, uh, sort of promote them, to expose their music, to provide connections, um, 
and uh, uh, and I and before I got to Haiti, one of the reasons they thought I could do this was I had I had done a um, an article in the Miami New Times on Haitian music, and then was asked to round up uh, albums of the year in Haiti for the Beat magazine. When I got to Haiti, almost the majority of musicians I I met had read those articles. It was shocking to me, actually. Uh, and so, um, and when the Beat asked me to write a regular column, they called it Haitian Fascination. I agreed because it really seemed to open up a, a myriad of possibilities to do this, right, to provide reciprocity. And um, movie director Jonathan Demi asked me to produce an album of Haitian music with him. As I was writing these columns, American and European record labels uh, turned to me to suggest Haitian bands for recordings. I was asked to bring Haitian uh, musicians for festivals. And then a lot of the musicians I was working with asked me to write liner notes for their first recordings abroad. And I kept cranking out these semi-monthly columns for the beat. I was reviewing recordings. I was profiling artists. I was diving into uh, genres and contexts. Um, so this, in, as it turned out, created a whole range of other ethical issues for me. Um, you know, the Beat Magazine wanted me not to just praise recordings, but also I mean, it was a reviewer. They wanted me to, to uh, assess them and pan, you know, weak recordings. And for every musician that I could hook up with a festival or a compilation album, there were scores that I was not recommending. And, and um, I found myself that this, that found that this attempt to return value and produce reciprocity put me in this role of a very visible culture broker, you know, an adjudicator, some kind of outside expert which was, to me, very resonant uh, with colonial legacies. Uh, it was a role that was especially in conflict with the humility that I wanted to bring to my study of music, uh, Asian music as an outsider. I thought every, every Asian musician knew more than I knew. Um, and uh, so the, uh, this was a, a conflict, uh, you know, for me perpetually and still is. Um, and uh, we can talk about it in the breakout room if anyone's interested. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Averill. Dr. Kessler, um, over to you. Oh, yes. Well, I think I, I've been very interested in the comments that have been made so far, and I, I think there are aspects of the things that have been mentioned that certainly pertain to uh, the area that uh, I'm most concerned with. The, this question of reciprocity, for instance, is uh, something that we struggle with all the time. Different community uh, concepts of what constitutes a healthy relationship compared to what uh, is a uh, standard practice in a university. So the, the, navigating that kind of cultural uh, boundary is uh, or interaction really is uh, is certainly a major issue. Uh, the question of vulnerability and agency is also something that uh, we work with all the time. Uh, particularly, um, and this is working with uh, older indigenous people who, for instance, experienced residential school. Um, uh, the vulnerabilities are evident in various ways, but the desire to be heard uh, and finally to be able to talk about their experiences is equally powerful. So finding a balance between those things and a way to conduct that that uh, is functional uh, for for them and uh, also for the our processes is, is a challenge. And the final thing I would add is that uh, in working with an indigenous people and communities, there's often kind of an obligation for a double form of consent. Uh, the consent of the individual, but also when the, uh, the individual is in the context of a community, depending on the nature of the uh, investigation or inquiry, um, the need to also consult with community uh, is, um, is also sometimes quite challenging. The challenge with that is often determining what do we mean in those instances by communities and um, how do we navigate circumstances in which uh, what would appear to be the logical authorizing body in a community is adversarial to the interests of some of the people uh, that we might be uh, wanting to work with or advocate for in some way. Um, for the Tri-Council policy you know, in this regard, the guidance to Chapter 9 is, I think, a really well-crafted uh, examination uh, of these issues with some very solid ways of thinking through the complexities. So I would recommend that to anybody who's uh, working with those, um, certainly with Indigenous people, but also similar issues in other communities might find it uh, useful as well. Great, thank you. And Dr. Conway. 
So as a cultural historian, my concern is to look to the past to see how ethical questions that are pressing today were asked or what are the historical antecedents of the questions that we're facing today. So in the most recent um, book I wrote, my interest in religious toleration and interfaith marriage was about finding a cultural response to um, a tradition largely defined by legal parameters and political statecraft. So in the case of religious toleration in the West, um, there was a practice of developing a statecraft that would help um, protect international trade and reduce uh, military conflicts at home and abroad. So when I turn to the novel, I become interested in questions of the private sphere, and in particular, the questions around interfaith marriage and the religious rights of women in the private sphere. So today, when we're talking about debates about secularism and Bill 21 in Quebec, um, we'll often see how or geopolitics of the West versus the East are framed around claims regarding women's rights and their religious rights, um, around uh, the, the idea of the West having um, an ethical uh, vantage point from which to pronounce on non-Western traditions uh, around uh, and, and, and uh, assigning tolerance and feminism to a secular West. Um, and you really see how those questions were framed in uh, the 18th century that I study as part of an enlightenment discourse and an emergent secularism um, and reflections on the rights of individuals. Uh, we also see how cultural narratives kind of stage these questions differently and provide different answers than do those questions asked by political theory, uh, government practice and, and intellectual history. So that's how I come at the ethical question. How does the past allow us to understand the challenges we're facing today? Very interesting. So the third question is, how can we facilitate better, more ethical practices in your area of interest? And I thought we could start with Dr. Averill on this. It may be if you wanted to jump off this tension you were describing between the, the best practices uh, from the IRBs versus what seems to be truly at the best interest of the community or, or another angle you take on this question. Sure. Well, on the, on the IRB piece, I think it just points to the need to continue to negotiate those kinds of structures in relationship to different disciplines. I have to say my own discipline uh, is well behind its partner, uh, sister discipline in anthropology in critiquing um, these, these relationships. And, you know, those who are, are most concerned with it in my discipline really tend to, to read the anthropological literature on uh, on this, um, there's just not enough produced. So one thing I would suggest is the production of, of interesting compilations on people's experiences like this, kind of like this, this format, but in my discipline. Uh, the other would be to embed uh, this kind of discussion in every, every co course or every course of study in really uh, uh, in a deep way, not a superficial introductory to a course, but a, a prolonged investigation of how we create symmetrical relationships, how we turn that vantage point that was talked about a minute into, a, into one that is really truly a dialogue of cultures and not an objectified study of the other. Um, and just make this and make this a part of every bit of training. Mm, nice. Um, Dr. Kessler, your thoughts on facilitating better, more ethical practices? Oh, sorry, you're on mute right now. Yeah, no, I got it. Uh, I certainly think that uh, education is clearly a key. So certainly within uh, our program, it's really built into the core curriculum. And, and the training and ethics is, I think, relatively extensive for an undergraduate program. So that's one key piece of it. I think in our field, uh, in Indigenous relations at the university, it's it's in some respects, in many places, a very new uh, uh, activity, uh, not in certain areas, but in others, uh, it is. And so I think uh, people come to us as faculty members or graduate students without prior orientation to this area that's very extensive, and particularly if they're coming from outside Canada. Um, there's more attention in North America to these issues, but it's still many people go through degrees without any uh, training in the area, and yet they find themselves wanting to do work, which is good. I mean, it's good that they have an interest in it, but the question is how to uh, then um, affect the way that the work is done. So one of the things when I was uh, working at the House of Learning and working with the strategic plan, one of the things we proposed was to uh, have a unit that would 
um, in a sense, collate uh, the most effective research practices and, and the most uh, adequate uh, address of relationship, uh, developing relationships in ways that uh, um, tend to not aggravate ethical concerns, but address them directly. Uh, and to make the um, those practices which are successful more available to people, uh, identify places where things did not work out so well without naming the specific circumstances, but really just looking at the structure of, of the, the issues that were involved and encourage new researchers in that, those areas to um, uh, learn as uh, they can from those examples, but then also to have a place to go to ask some questions. I think the thing to be avoided uh, in doing that is to position some unit at the university as the troubleshooter in these relationships so that there is, my, uh, in my experience, very little way that that works out well. But I think the um, driving uh, through uh, identifying uh, examples of what does work well and then identifying problems that have arisen as a, a way to give people a, a, a way to uh, see um, what are more effective and more ethical practices more clearly and uh, you know to move towards the light both because it's the right thing to do but also because it's a much more effective way to be successful in their work yeah uh dr conway um, so for me, the, the central concern for cultural critics like me and uh, other scholars in the humanities are to develop public facing ways of uh, addressing large questions. Um, how do we value the Western art tradition and the contributions it's made to our thinking about ethical questions, you know, while recognizing its implication in Anglo-European um, systems of oppression? Um, how do we grapple with questions of artist identity and appropriation uh, like those uh, involved in the controversies surrounding Joseph Boyden? Um, so that is so a kind of public humanities can allow us to frame those questions, to provide the history of those questions um, and, and provide you know, a larger public to engage with scholars who have, uh, have studied the global kind of context in which they arise um, and can give really informed and contextualized responses and, and ways of, of situating these questions so that um, we don't kind of run into dead ends in relation to these questions over and over again. So I think it's facilitating conversation, um, framing the ethical questions in ways that uh, incorporate the research that we've done um, and helping the university be, be part of a, of a larger public discourse. And over to you, Dr. Cox. Yeah, I thought I might just talk for a moment about um, another hat I wear, which is in my, my teaching at the graduate level, I teach a course on qualitative health research. And that is a course that's very focused on methodology and ethics is deeply interwoven with that. And the solution I think in part in, in the long run has to be in training researchers to really take, um, first of all, take their time with these issues. There's so much in the academic world that pressures us to come quickly to a conclusion or make a decision or meet a deadline. And, and oftentimes ethical questions are not amenable to that. So I'm a big advocate of what I would call slow ethics, uh, which really derives from the slow scholarship movement. And before that, the slow food movement. And it literally means stopping and taking however much time is needed to to engage in meaningful dialogue and reflection uh, so that a mutually acceptable and locally made solution can arise. And so for us in the context of the dementia project, that meant that we came together with all of our participants in a bunch of online Zoom chats around what should this art exhibition look like and how would they like to be identified in that exhibition. And we went back and forth and it took a lot of time, but Eventually we decided everyone was comfortable with using their first name, but not their last name. And no one would be identified with tags like 
being a person with dementia or being a care person. And we were all a team of people who collaborated in creating the exhibition. And, and that solution only arose because we took a lot of time together to engage in very self-reflexive and deep listening around what felt right for everyone and to find a kind of consensus that um, mirrored not just what we as researchers thought was right, um, but what our collaborator participants really believed was right for them. Oh. And uh, that's a message I believe very strongly. In, and I think it's really something that is essential to our training of future researchers. Beautiful, thank you. So the final question before we go into breakout rooms is how can students and faculty at UBC get more involved in ethics scholarship and education pertaining to the arts? So with an eye to that, many of the participants here today might be looking to get more involved in ethics scholarship and education. And we um, do just have three minutes before we would like to go into the breakout rooms where we people can ask more specific questions to you. So if you could keep your answers to this one nice and short. Um, Dr. Kessler, we'll start with you. Uh, well, I, 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 the easy answer is take some of our courses that focus on, uh, on exactly these ethical questions. But of course, we, we don't want our unit overrun with the, uh, the, the incredible interest in this area, um, which I hope there actually is. Um, but I think the, the way to do that is to develop more training and more disciplines that is uh, sensitive to the ethics. So for some disciplines, that is specific research ethics. In our discipline, for instance, we concentrate on uh, oral history interviewing, for instance, uh, and that has a very specific set of uh, ethical concerns. But many other um, many other uh, units across campus deal in one way or another with interactions with, in, in my case, with indigenous communities. And they may not involve specific research protocols that fall under um, uh, ethics board guidelines, but they involve the formation of relationships, which can be done in more or less ethical ways. And I think there, there are very uh, clear ways in which units can develop ways of thinking through the issues that will lead to more ethical practices in those relationships. And those will inform uh, all kinds of research that would be done in that area. But also, more critically, they will inform their uh, ability of their students and their colleagues to work effectively in those situations in ways that are helpful to communities and bring credit to the institution. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Conway. For me, the central question is um, having having worked hard to recover marginalized voices in my own research. Um, how can I? How can the university foster classrooms, um, mentorship programs, and um, hiring practices that will see greater numbers of those members of those communities uh, among our faculty? So the ethical question for me is how does the how does the research I do correspond to changing the face of the institution? Amazing, yeah, Dr. Cox. Yeah, I'm going to put in a brief plug for the Center for Applied Ethics. We have a graduate fellowship program. So uh, graduate students at UBC, no matter what program, we welcome applications to come and spend a year at the center and work with a faculty mentor and be part of a community that is working in applied ethics and give you an opportunity to work on some ethics related aspect of your research or your program that you might not otherwise uh, get to attend to. So I just want to flag that out there for everyone who's doing graduate work at UBC if you have an interest uh, in further training in ethics. All right, and Dr. Averill to wrap us up. Oh gosh, that's a lot of responsibility. I would just, uh, building on the comments of my, my colleagues here, I, I just like to open up a problem, which is that, you know, we when we often, often when we talk about ethics and we, we develop programs in ethics, we're talking, we're referencing a, a deeply historical Euro-Mediterranean uh, system of thought that, that, that has evolved um, um, yeah, within, within uh, Euro-Mediterranean uh, philosophy. And I think we're, we're at a point where we understand that there are philosophical standpoints and, and um, that, that emerge in different cultural situations around the world. And I think we need to actually begin interrogating what we mean by ethics and bringing together um, very different approaches to ethics 
uh, not just using the framework of a existing system of thought around ethics to approach it. So, uh, and that would, in, in our case here, uh, involve a uh, deep uh, engagement with uh, indigenous ethics. Really beautifully said. Um, so what we're going to do right now is we are going to take a few moments to allow uh, panelists or to allow participants from the breakout rooms uh, to let us know uh, what you learned. If there's anything you'd like to share, you can either uh, use a raise hand function um, about something you'd like to bring to the group, something new you learned today, or you can write in the chat and I can help uh, vocalize that. But uh, because we couldn't all be in all the rooms, I think uh, people would love to hear what happened in some of the other rooms. And Louise, would just to clarify, would you prefer to, uh, would we prefer to hear from others who are in the rooms rather than from us again? I hope. Um, well, that'd be great if there's any brave audience members who would like to, to speak, but uh, faulting that we will hear from you. Yes, I do see a raised hand. Uh, I, I suppose I'll be brave. Um, I really like Dr. Conway's uh, description of the process of accounting for Canada in, in fictional writing of using that as a, as a process. Um, and and building the questions into the. Oh, you're you oh, muted. Oh, Was I muted the whole time? I thought. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just got muted. Okay. How far do we get? Uh, accounting for Canada and building it into the process. Those are the two main. Yes. Thank you. Doctor Ellis. Thanks, Louise. So um, I was in a breakout with um, with Dean Avril and Steve Pellick and Ari Rottenberg, and um, we were talking a, a lot about um, music, of course, um, in the context of indigenous peoples and knowledges. And I, I I came away with four really interesting themes that I marked down on a small piece of paper. And one was, um, and please, those of us in the breakout room jump in if I've completely butchered this or you want to add and Dean Avril, please comment on my comment. So the following the themes were hybridization versus homogenization. Like how do we look to a future where we actually come together and share knowledges and ideologies and values um, while, and, and we're still remaining distinct in our identities and not getting too homogenized and, and blurred. Um, another theme I thought we talked about, or I heard we talked about, was the tensions between and the importance of properly negotiating sharing knowledge and sharing music um, versus keeping some things very sacred. And how do we negotiate that? The fourth theme for us, we talked a little bit about conflicting permissions. How do you go into a community and when you have multiple layers of permissions that are needed, and there may be some disagreement between uh, who can give permission and what permissions those are. How do we negotiate that? And I just kind of pull the whole thing together in our short breakout group, and I wish we had had much, much more time with Dean Avril, is about trust. How, how do we engage in trustworthy uh, and transparent interactions with one another, no matter who we are? So back to you, Louise, thank you for that moment. Nice. Thanks for that. Um, anyone else uh, from the breakout room with the other panelists that they'd like to speak to? Yes. Shirley McDonald. Oh, hi. Yeah, my uh, my takeaway from Dr. Kessler's discussion was really will really impact my my teaching because I teach composition I give students topics to discuss and my question was how do we address students emotional engagement especially when it's extreme when they're in, when they're studying indigenous issues in Canada and I realize I need to create some topics some essay topics that ask them as Dr. Kessler says how would they like things to progress what do they see for the future so that was a, a great takeaway Wonderful. yeah thank you Anyone else have any? Yes, Ashley. 
Hi. Um, thank you for um, bringing these people together. It was wonderful to hear from Dr. Cox. And one, one thing I'd like to highlight that I, I found at least to me profound and interesting, it was entirely novel, was how she described that there's some people who can really connect with, with sharing emotions or ideas that they didn't realize that they had a strong opinion on until they do it through a different means of, of communication, be it through arts or engagement or moving their body or um, pen to paper. Um, I think you gave the example, uh, Dr. Cox, that you could have asked someone about these issues in an interview and you wouldn't have gotten an answer, but you, you talked about this theater engagement program and having these people come together and share um, a theatrical experience made them so much more open to discussing it afterwards or sharing their opinions about the actors and by proxy all those issues. So I thought it was a really fascinating way to engage various people in, in the research process. So that was great. Thanks. Really interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other brave folks? Ralph Matthews, yes. I can't find my electronic hand. I had to use my <laughs> um, I, I was in Susan Cox and I was in it deliberately because it's an area I don't think about much, which is the role of the arts. And if there was something that she said that triggered for me thoughts, it was towards the end where she discussed getting the people to talk about what the experience of being in their project felt like and emotionally related to. And I, I, I thought that was an important insight. And, and we, 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 we need to, go to uh, I remember being told many times I should go back and bring findings back to the people but whenever I do that, they tell me I got it wrong. And I'm either a, a very bad researcher or I caught the life of that community or that organization, you know, two years ago and now I've written it up. And a lot has happened to them then. They're in a different space now. But if we were to ask them what it was like to be in that space at the very time they were in it, I think that's, that's a, a, a thoughtful way to go about it. Um, um, I'm part of a, a, a uh, on the board of a, of a uh, organization called ASK, which provides adult daycare for seniors. And it looks like we're going to get funding to open two new centers. Uh, and so I'm hunting around for one of the reasons I went into Susan's was I'm hunting around for programs. Everybody else on the board is trying to find how to build the building. And, I, and I'm far more interested in what are we going to do there and to what benefit, particularly when we're dealing frequently with people in various stages of dementia? Uh, and we can provide for their health, we can monitor their exercise, uh, but, but how do we engage them and produce the trust that, that, that uh, Judy just talked about? All right, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to present one last question to the panelists uh, before we wrap up. Uh, which is just based on what we discussed today, if there is one resource you could recommend to interested participants uh, to learn more about ethics in your area of interest, book, article, it could just be a scholar whose work they might want to look into, a, a film. Um, you can maybe type in the chat as well uh, when you say it so people can easily look it up. Um, who would like to start? Does anyone have something off the top of their head, any of the panelists? Yes, Dr. Kessler. I'd like to recommend a film and it's uh, a film which, you know, they're in the sort of indigenous history of Canada. There are two films that I think everyone should see. One is Ganesatage, the film about the Oka crisis by Alan East. Uh, but the other one is Finding Dawn by Christine Welsh. And Finding Dawn is a, uh, sort of about, uh, without ever mentioning the name Picton, it's about uh, Picton murders, but it really focuses not on Picton, but on the people, um, the victims. Uh, but it includes a lot of interviews that really talk about the history of how the, the system through which um, the victims for predators are produced routinely in Canadian society. Um, and it includes uh, quite a bit of interviewing. And I think uh, 
It's kind of a, a really good way to understand some of the background issues that inform our area, uh, although from a from a dire perspective, I guess, although that seems to be common. Um, but also, I think it raises a lot of uh, and addresses a lot of very interesting ways of talking about ethics. And the, the, the dual consent community versus individual consent, for instance, it gets directly addressed at the end of that film in a way which is fascinating. And I'll just add that if somebody, if she had done a film on the last third of the film by itself, I don't know. I think she would have been personally in danger of uh, reprisals. But because it came at the end of the film that she made and it was contextualized in the way in which it was contextualized, it was a very important contribution. It got to the point of being able to talk about an issue which is very difficult, but to do it in a way that was framed uh, in, in such a way that um, it worked ethically and it also worked rhetorically and uh and i i hope it worked for some politically but if you watch it it'll have worked a little bit more so i recommend it highly and national film board you can see it for free yes thank you and i, I found the links to those and put them in the chat for everyone um dr conway do you want to speak briefly to what you've put in the chat here sure i i, I wish i could come up with a uh, a more um popular cultural reference, but I, off the top of my head, I just want to really recommend as a historical account of, of Western ways of understanding selfhood in relation to indigenous questions, um, Robbie Richardson's The Savage and the Modern Self, North American Indians in 18th century British literature and culture. Great. And Dr. Cox, did you think of anything on the spot? Yes, I have one go to that I tell all my students about. It's a book called The Narrative Study of Lives by Ruth Ellen Josselson. And it's a, a very deep treatment of uh, the topic of being in dialogue with others in the nature of relationship, which is profoundly ethical, but it really speaks to the dilemmas a lot of students face in doing their first research in that she talks about what it's like to be in conversation with someone and then take yourself out of conversation and turn that conversation to your own purpose and try to write about it to a different audience and how difficult that is in a very profound ethical way. And it's a book that I think really speaks to so much of what we've all touched on around uh, the importance of ethics and reciprocity in relationship and community. Sounds fascinating. And Dr. Averill? Sure, you know, I was just thinking um, maybe it would be nice if, if people wanted to read a, a um, an ethnographic account from my discipline, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, I put her book here, Louise Menkes, part because she does a kind of research that would fit with Susan Cox's slow research. She, she probably turns that book every 15 years maybe. Um, but they're beautifully written poetic accounts. This last book um, uh, follows over, over about 25 years uh, relationships with Zulu dance troops as uh, South Africa negotiates the transition from apartheid to, um, uh, to post-apartheid period, negotiates her relationship uh, across as, as a um, white South African, um, now you know, later on ethnomusicologist working with this, works on the on the transitions of, of um, masculinity as these dance troops, which were an expression, uh, not a kind of a half made up 20th century expression, um, you know, an invented cultural tradition in some ways, but carries on a voodoo, a, voodoo, a, a Zulu notion of masculinity as it as they um, uh, move through this, uh, you know, uh, migrant labor uh, practices in South Africa. It's just a beautiful, highly ethical book that wrestles with all the, the ethics I was talking about earlier. And so, uh, yeah, if you want to read a, an ethnographic account, it's a good one. These all sound really great. Thank you so much. Um, before we close momentarily, I'm going to thank the panelists. Thank you so much uh, for joining and bringing your really diverse perspectives. Uh, Dr. Judith Hall from uh, Senior Administration for opening uh, to you all for attending the participants and engaging 
and the rest of the organizing team at Neuroethics Canada, Dr. Judy Illis, Dr. Paul Van Donkelar, Marianne Bicani, and, and Anna Neuterlein. And our second installment in the series focuses on technology and is coming up on February 23rd. Um, and everyone, the panelists and the participants will receive a follow-up survey to further the goals of ethics for UBC and information about the next panels. So that concludes our events. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining and we really hope to see you at the next one. Thanks for organizing it. It's a great idea. <laughs> thank you.